Well, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on uh, a very important book, In From the Cold. It doesn't show up very well on the screen, but I do hope you can all see it. I'm Joan Beaumont and um, I'm a Professor Emerita in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU. And I'd like to start tonight by acknowledging and celebrating the First Nations on whose traditional lands we meet. And I think we may all be meeting on somewhat different traditional lands tonight. But of course, ANU is pay, in particular pays its respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present and emerging. And I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people in Victoria, in Melbourne. A few uh, practical issues before we begin our proceedings. Just need to let you all know that this event is being recorded. And uh, if you wish to ask a question uh, of the panel, please use the chat facility. We will leave time for questions at the end of the various presentations. And I'd like to just in particular over by thanking Liam Bruin Higgins, who is with us and who edited the book um, that we have in, uh, to discuss tonight. Now, I imagine you're all aware because you have joined this webinar that uh, in 25th of June, indeed today marks 70 years since the outbreak of the Korean War. Though I think, as the authors of this book point out, indeed this was a, a peninsula that had a very long and tragic history of conflict well before 1950. Um, Fought in the immediate aftermath of World War II, the Korean War is often claimed by those who took part in it to be the Forgotten War. But I think there are many reasons that it should be remembered, as it is in this book. Firstly, it was a war that caused immense suffering and devastation for the peoples of the two Koreas in those massive seesawing campaigns that, that drove across the peninsula. And there were, of course, the threat of nuclear wars hanging over the conflict too. It's estimated that perhaps two and a half million people lost their lives in, in, this, in this period. It's a very important conflict to remember also because it's one of the few um, major United Nations operations of its kind. Of course, there's been many other UN operations, but of this particular multinational force kind, it's, it's very distinctive. And of course, the Korean War is still technically going. The armistice that was called in 1953 and the agreements of 1954 never really brought the war to an end and the tensions between the communist north and the democratic south remain with, with, with us today as a source of instability and global tension. Now this book is about Australia's contribution to the Korean War but it, given the multinational uh, nature of the forces fighting the Korean War and the character of war itself it is inherently international. And fortunately, the, the team that contributed to the book is what I might call a galaxy of academic expertise and specialists drawn, drawn from many universities and from various institutions, the Imperial War Museum in London and the Australian War Memorial. And I'd like to thank particularly Peter Pedersen uh, from the Australian War Memorial for his part work on the conference some years ago that it have, uh, has ultimately resolved in this book. But when I say galaxy, let me justify that term. We have, by my count, at least five authors who have contributed to official histories of, of Australia's military conflicts. Perhaps most importantly, we'll be hearing from you later, uh, Professor Bob O'Neill, who is the author of the definitive two-volume official history of the Korean War, published in 1981 and 1986. We also, I think, have in the audience Peter Edwards, and he's one of the authors, the official, um, who is the official historian of Australia's involvement in Southeast Asian conflicts from 1948 to 75. David Horner, whose involvement in official history is so long that I've hardly got time to describe it all tonight, but most importantly, the official historian for the, um, the many multi-volumed Australian peacekeeping, humanitarian and post-Cold -Cold War operations. And of course, the official history of ASIO, um, the first volume of which won the uh, Prime Minister's Award for Australian History. Then we have John Blackson, one of the editors of this volume, now official historian for the Australian Signals Directorate, and a, uh, a major contributor to the official histories of um, Australia's security organisations. Then one of the authors, now at Deakin University, but a major contribu contributor to the official history of peacekeeping is Bob Breen, who um, is again represented in this volume. And then this team of Australian that I've mentioned, of official historians, is joined by a number of other uh, 
very eminent um, and, and appropriate um, authors, Cameron Forbes, Jack McCaffrey from the Royal Australian Navy Sea Power Centre, Colin Khan, who actually had battle experience of the Korean War, leading the patrols and, and commanding the 5th Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment in Vietnam, Rowan Kallick, a prize-winning journalist who's won both the Graham Perkins Award and two Walkley Awards, and then from the United States, Richard Hallian, um, former historian of the US Air Force and holder of the, of, of the General Harold Keith Johnson Chair of Military History at the US Army War College, Alan Millett, a huge name in the field of military history and Ambrose history of the at the University of New Orleans and also in the US but a scholar of Sino-American relations in the Cold War, Xiaobing Li at the University of Central Oklahoma. Then from the United Kingdom we have uh, Nigel Steele from the Imperial War Museum, Sir William Purves, a National Serviceman Commissioner at the age of 18, who served in the Korean War and is now trustee of the Imperial War Museum. And from Korea, John Ma Na, who is Professor of, De of the Department of Military History at the Korea Military Academy of Seoul, and also an active infantry officer and Lieutenant Colonel in the ROK Army. And I think that very short summary of the, of the contributors to the volume shows what an interesting mix we have here of both academic and practical uh, military experience. And I know both Bob and David and uh, themselves have had bring to the study of military history their own experience of having uh, been involved in some of the major conflicts that Australia has fought in the region. There is no contributor from North Korea, and I asked one of the editors and he said, oh, that was a bridge too far. And then we concluded that perhaps he was mixing up his wars with that image. Um, but nonetheless, we hope eventually that collaboration will be such that we can hear more of the North Korean perspective. Now the volume, as you're probably all aware, covers a broad field of strategy, uh, diplomacy, command, the war on land, sea and air, and the legacies of the conflict, which I know we'll all be interested in discussing. But enough from me, let me explain how we're now going to proceed. Uh, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from four of the contributors to the volume. Um, John Blacksman, Michael Kelly, Rebecca Fleming, and David Horner, but not necessarily in that order. And then I'll be inviting Emeritus Professor Bob O'Neill um, to make a comment on those four, first uh, four commentaries. And then um, we'll open the uh, discussion just to further contributions, both from the audience and perhaps from the authors. Um, so first of all, let me invite uh, John Blackson uh, to reflect a little on some of what he thinks the book is contributing, the historiography of the Korean War. And also, I know he has some particular insights he'd like to draw our attention to. John. Uh, Joan, thank you very much, firstly, for chairing this, uh, this launch, this event, this webinar. Uh, we're, we're really uh, honoured to have your company. Uh, we are in the company here virtually with uh, one of Australia's uh, most significant historians, who happens to be a woman, but is an extraordinary academic and extraordinary scholar, a scholar and, a, and colleague. So thank you very much for chairing this. Um, and thank you for the, uh, the introduction. Um, this is, you know, why, why should we be looking at the Korean War again for crying out loud, it was 70 years ago. And so many other historians have covered this, haven't they? Well, of course, we've got Bob O'Neill's magisterial too, Bob. And, um, but as he pointed out uh, for those who were here earlier, uh, they are now nearly 40 years old, those works. Um, and um, they, they stand on their own um, merits, no question. But we thought it was appropriate to uh, bring a fresh publication uh, that, that, that drew on his incredible scholarship uh, to say something fresh. And of course, to do that, we had to bring him in uh, as part of the, part of the project. Um, so I just wanted to flag that there is scholarship from um, uh, a number of other countries. And we touched on this in the introduction, uh, and I thank Liam Bruin Higgins for helping with pulling that together uh, on from the United States, United Kingdom, uh, Canada, the Republic of Korea, from uh, China and other countries as well. This is this is a, a war that, to a certain extent, while it's some consider it the forgotten war, is actually one that's really pretty much covered in terms of the rigor of scholarship. Um, 
But it's also the first war of the atomic age. Um, and of course, that age hasn't gone away. You live with it. That's one of Russia, uh, or the Soviet Union as it was then, and China were directly and actively involved. And Australia was only a bit player in this equation. This is something we need to keep up in, in, in perspective. <clears throat> Um, because, you know, I, last thing we want to do is be jingoistic about Australia's role in this and, and pat ourselves on the back about how good we were and, uh, and, uh, and so on. I just want to share you, uh, with you a couple of maps that, that are from the book. And I have to say, uh, the, 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 the geo, uh, the geo, uh, the mammal, uh, Arctis, I think it is, um, at the ANU, who pulled this together, ANU uh, geo, uh, cartography team, done an extraordinary job with the maps. So let me just show you a couple of the maps. And if you haven't got the book yet, uh, you can download it for free. Um, and, uh, and, and let me just walk you through for a minute here, just a bit of a perspective you get from, uh, from the maps. You can see that now, Tess? Everybody nod, Joan, you can see that? We can, yep. yes I can. <clears throat> All right, so you can see there three RAR joins at the bottom. Uh, now, of course, the first force is to join the Air Force. Um, uh, 70, uh, 77 Squadron joined. They'd been based in Japan. They go across. They uh, support uh, the, the American forces that are going there under UN mandate. Um, three RAR lands at Busan. The Royal Australian Navy participates as well. You get there, how uh, the kind of the trekking that 3RAR does up and down the countryside, uh, successive months of the camp, early months of the campaign. But I want to give you a sense just also from this of um, how uh, little we did. Uh, as you can see, the, the front as it settled by, by 1951, um, and some of the sites there, Marion Sang, uh, the Hook, Cap Yong, uh, Apple Orchard in the north there north of Pyongyang uh, and a broken bridge where three RER, the northernmost uh, battle sites Australia fought at, at Chongju uh, uh, and so on. You can see quite an extraordinary space. Uh, but then as the war settled down, uh, Australia's contribution on land uh, was only uh, a battalion, three RER, and it grew to a two a battalion group within a brigade setting, uh, which with two and three R, two and one RAR rotating, uh, but three RAR staying for the duration. Um, did you get a sense? There's a four, 13 division frontage there, of course. So Australia is contributing to the first Commonwealth division as it's formed from three brigades: a Canadian brigade, a British brigade, and a composite brigade uh, with Brits and Kiwis and Aussies. Um, and you can see there on the left hand side, there's in small font, British Commonwealth Division. Uh, and if you just go down one more step, you can see that space that the British Commonwealth Division occupied. And then uh, uh, on the left, you can see the hook, which features in the book, at the last book, the chapter that uh, I think Michael Kelly is going to speak to. And on the top right there, carrying Singh and just a controversial battle, which covered, gets a few chapters uh, talking about it. But the, the maps really do help uh, enormously um, with uh, giving you a sense of, uh, and the pictures as well, of what was going on there. Um, so I do just want to say a couple, a couple additional points. Let me just get out of the mapping sharing now. I'll come back to so you can put in my ugly dial again. Um, the, uh, the Korean War is a, a turning point. Remember that Dean Etchison had only a few months prior to the outbreak of war, really uh, articulated a, an offshore balancing strategy that counted uh, Taiwan and Korea as unsalvageable. Uh, and Truman was uh, obviously forced by the politics and the, and the, the optics of abandon, abandoning uh, its commitments there uh, after the invasion of the South Korea by, uh, uh, that was monitored by two Australians, uh, uh, Major Stuart Beach and Squadron Leader Ronald Rankin. Um, and so while it, it was a turning point, it helped form the alliance uh, with Australia, uh, the ANZUS Alliance, uh, the American commitment to the hub and spokes model, um, which today resonates because we are still today talking about our relationship with the United States. The hub and spokes has, has morphed since then. Um, we are still technically at war. Uh, the the, the, the uh, armistice is uh, a fragile one to this day. Uh, 
Kim Jong-un and his uh, younger sister, Kim Yo-jong, had been involved in blowing up a, a, an establishment on the border that was supposed to symbolize reconciliation between North and South. Despite Moon Jae-in's best efforts in the South, in the Republic of Korea, the North Koreans appeared determined to not only hold on to their nuclear weapons, but to uh, spurn the South uh, in, re in retaliation for the enduring uh, sanctions that have been imposed. Of course, this leaves us with a bit of a predicament because we have an Australian Deputy Commander of the UN Command there, um, Admiral Stu Mayer. We have uh, an enduring commitments there and a whole lot of questions about what Australia might do uh, should there be uh, an escalation in that space. And of course, that's a bigger question than Korea. And, you know, that's something we can perhaps entertain in the Q&A afterwards. But I think I've said enough for now. And back to you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was a very, very good time. Thank you. Now, I'd like to move to Rebecca Fleming, um, who provides us with a very different perspective on the Korean War. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, I'm really pleased to, to have a volume in this chapter, a chapter in this volume about the Australian nurses who served in the Korean War. I think a lot of people's um, knowledge of the medical services in Korea might be match related to the TV show. But uh, the, the services of Australian nurses is, is a really interesting story that I think not many people know. So there were about um, a bit over 200 um, Australian nurses who contributed uh, to supporting the casualties from Korea, the British Commonwealth casualties. And the majority of them actually served in Japan, where the main hospital was based, the British Commonwealth General Hospital. And about 50, around 30 uh, army nurses and around 20 RAF nurses also served in Korea. The RAF nurses were involved in evacuating the casualties um, from Korea. Uh, they overall, the RAF, when they took over from the US Air Force um, in early 1951, they ev evacuated over 14,000 casualties, close to 15,000, um, over the period in which they took part. And the RAF nurses were the senior medical personnel on board. So they actually had a very important role. And they, they made the final decision on whether a patient was fit enough to fly because they had the medical responsibility for them. So the story of the nurses takes us beyond the battlefield. We often hear of, of casualties and, and we'll note in a, in a story of battle that casualties are evacuated, but we take, we take the story beyond that um, when, we took, when we look at medical stories um, to the casualties and, and what happened to them, but also to those who care for them, which I think is really relevant in, uh, in the situation we, we find ourselves in globally at the moment with COVID-19. Um, I think historians in the future will look at the medical teams uh, and the role they've played in caring for the casualties. Um, so part of that role is, is an emotional burden as well as the physical act of work. Um, the emotional act of caring is, is it import, important historically. And in the Korean War, the nurses I interviewed spoke a lot about the emotion of the Burns patients. So a number of, uh, they got a lot of patients came in, as we know, the winters in Korea are very cold uh, and sometimes improvised heating devices would explode. And you'd see um, uh, burns, quite serious burns from that and from, and from other injuries. And I just wanted to read you a quote from Betty Hunt-Smith, one of the nurses who talks about um, the trauma of nursing burns patients. She said, I had to deal with a patient and I walked towards him and I stopped. And I almost turned and walked out again because he had been burnt by a flamethrower so that his entire face and his ears and hands were totally burnt. So I had to pull, just pull myself together and go to him, to talk to him. So that emotional burden of caring, that moment of pause before she took that role uh, is something that I think it, you can see across military history, but you can also see across the history of medical nursing uh, and medical treatment in general. Uh, so there's clearly parallels with today. Uh, Korea for the, for the military nursing history, Australian military nursing history was also a period of transition so you see a lot of continuities with nursing history in the past. Uh, some, some nurses from the Second World War nursed in Korea, like Dulcie Thompson, and they also faced problems in Korea as the nurses in Lemnos, in, who had supported the Gallipoli casualties in 1915, had, had faced with the um, limited supplies. So initially in, in the hospital in Seoul, in Korea, they didn't have running water. Um, and, you know, uh, so that kind of story carries on and some things stay the same, but some things change. And for with the women's services, including uh, nursing in the 1950s, we saw um, a focus on career. 
So people have joined in the past for the duration of a conflict, in support of a conflict. Uh, military nursing became a career and many of the leaders who went on to serve in Malaya and in Vietnam had, the, had their first conflict experience in the Korean War. So Nell Espy, for example, uh, who became matron in chief of the Royal Australian Army Nursing Corps. She served initially in Korea and then she went on to Malaya and Vietnam. So um, as Prof Professor Horner points out in chapter eight, he talks about the leadership of the people in the of, of, of leaders in the army and how they developed uh, uh, during, during the war. That was also mirrored in, in military nursing in both the RAF and the army. Uh, so it's a really interesting period um, for military nursing. They worked as part of an integrated unit from the beginning. Uh, they were part of a British Commonwealth team and they worked with doctors, nurses and other medical staff across the British Commonwealth team, which was a really interesting aspect of the Korean War specifically uh, that they had done so from the beginning. So there's, there's a lot uh, to look at in, in the chapter. I hope you all enjoy it. I don't want to take up too much time. I've learned a great deal um, from reading the papers in the book and my thanks to all the editors uh, and the ANU for working so hard to get this book to publication. Uh, it's a beautiful book and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Rebecca. That's extremely interesting. And I think it's a story that very few of us know much about and, and it's a very original contribution. Now, before I invite um, our next speaker, I'm sure by now you're all very interested in buying the book. So I need to put in the advertisement before we lose any of you. The book has been published by ANU Press and you'll find it on their website. You can buy a handsome hard copy as already displayed or thanks to the incredibly enlightened policy of ANU Press, you can download it for free. So um, please make sure you, you, you know, read the other chapters or indeed the chapters of the authors we're hearing from tonight, but dip more in widely into the book. We we'll move now to David Horner, another emeritus professor. We seem to have many emeritus professors at SDSC. And as I've mentioned, you know, perhaps one of Australia's most distinguished military um, historians as well as an official historian of great repute. David, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jane, and uh, good evening to everybody who's, uh, who's watching this uh, event tonight. Uh, my chapter in the book is called Australian Higher Command in the Korean War, the experiences of Brigadier John Wilton. And the importance of this chapter is that Brigadier Wilton took command of the 28th Commonwealth Brigade just three months before the end of the war, but he gained a huge amount of experience of working with the Americans and with other countries, and that stood him in very good stead when later he became Chief of the General Staff, and more importantly, Chairman of the Australian Chiefs of Staff Committee during the Vietnam War. But it caused me to think more broadly about the impact of the Korean War on the development of the Australian Regular Army. And we need to remember that the ARA, the Australian Regular Army, had only been formed in June 1947. Until then, we had a part-time militia, except for the periods of the two world wars when the Australian Imperial Force was formed from volunteers. So it was a new experience for Australia to have a regular army. And similarly, the Royal Military College had been set up to provide staff officers for this part-time militia army. And suddenly the military college had to produce officers for this new regular army. And so uh, for the first time, we had officers graduating from Duntroon who were going to command appointments as junior officers in a regular infantry battalion. And this was extremely important for the development of, of, the, uh, of the army. <coughs> The, the experience of the first, of the first battalion to go to, to, to Korea, the third battalion, sort of set the, set the standards and the ethos for the Royal Australian Regiment that was to continue for the uh, pre, uh, 70 years right to the, the present time. Now, if we think of some of those young officers who graduated but in Dunshun, uh, their experiences are, are really quite remarkable. For example, the graduates from the 1940 uh, um, eight class from Dunshun, 14 of them went to 3RAR, which was then in Korea, and 12 of them became, became platoon commanders in 3RAR. One of them was killed in action, and six of them, of them were later to command battalions in Vietnam. 
Um, one of them, General uh, Sir, uh, Sir Philip Bennett, became Chief of the Defence Force Staff, and another, uh, David Butler, became a Major General. Now, these, these officers were from the three-year uh, course at Duntroon, which finished in 1948. Duntroon then converted to a four-year course, so the next group of graduates came out at the end of 1950. And it's remarkable to think that within the, that within the year of them graduating, six of those officers had been awarded decorations for courage, leadership and, and bravery in the Battle of Marianne Sand, providing a bedrock for the Australian Army of junior officers with combat experience. If we follow the idea through further, during the Vietnam War, we had 17 battalion commanders. 16 of them served in the Korean War. The one who did not had previously served as a platoon commander in the Second World War. So they brought to the, uh, to the, the, the war in Vietnam a tremendous amount of experience. Other officers who served in, uh, in Korea um, provided uh, experience at a higher level. For example, I've mentioned John Wilton, who commanded the 28th Commonwealth Brigade and who later became chairman of the Chiefs of Staff Committee. He, his predecessor in Korea was Brigadier Tom Daly. He became Chief of the General Staff during the Vietnam War. Frank Hassett, who commanded the battalion at Battle of Marion San, became the Chief of the Defence Force Staff. He was succeeded as Chief of the Defence Force Staff by Arthur MacDonald, who commanded a battalion in Korea. And another battalion commander from Korea, Ron Hughes, uh, commanded the task force in Vietnam. So you can see the carrying through of this experience from the Korean War through the Vietnam War and the building up of this experience in the Australian regular army. And it wasn't just a matter of officers. For example, George Chin, who was the regimental sergeant major at the uh, Battle of Marion Sand, also served in Vietnam. So what was the, what is the contemporary relevance to this? Uh, and I'm reminded that from the end of our commitment in the Vietnam War, say 1972 through to the early 1990s, the Australian Army had no combat experience. And then we saw a parallel experience from the Korean War through to the Vietnam War with what's happened in the Army more recently. Young officers who served in Somalia and Rwanda, for example, went on to command battalions uh, and later higher ranks in the uh, uh, Interfet uh, um, uh, mission in East Timor and more particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. David Hurley, who commanded the battalion in Somalia, became Chief of the Defence Force and now is Governor General. So we see a, a, a similar pattern uh, of, and, and it's, it's part of the development of the Australian Regular Army, which all began back just shortly before and was solidified during the Korean War. Thanks David, that's a really fascinating sort of genealogy of the Australian Army almost. Now we'll turn to our final author, um, well not our final author, but our final short presentation tonight from Michael Kelly. I mentioned earlier that this volume involved collaboration, particularly between the ANU and the Australian War Memorial. And uh, are you in the Australian War Memorial tonight, Michael? Could yes, I am, Joan, I'm uh, yes. still in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so let's invite you to speak about your, your chapter and your impressions of the book. Thank you, Michael. Thanks very much, Joan. I know uh, as a, uh, a junior member of staff at the time when this conference was uh, given, uh, I had the privilege to attend it as a conference attendee. And when I joined the history team here, I was given the book uh, manuscript to see what I could do with to publish it. And as a, uh, a non-contributing uh, presenter, uh, my colleagues had said, well, write a chapter. So I had a look through the manuscript <laughs> and read it and was, was really impressed. And, <coughs> It was uh, David's chap in uh, Wilton that uh, really inspired me to look at the hook more closely uh, and explore the uh, the second battalion's role at the hook, but also its interoperability with uh, the United States Marines next door, who took the brunt of that fight uh, in that very last battle of the Australian uh, of the uh, of the Korean War. I'm sorry, that uh, when I uh, was able to start researching, I was uh, very very lucky to have uh, some great uh, people like Roger Lee over at Army History Unit at the time, uh, and yourself and uh, John as well. Uh, give me some encouragement and uh, feedback onto where I could go and, and to, to where I could actually uh, obtain records and write this chapter. And uh, I think I came up with some uh, uh, fairly interesting insights onto uh, why the Chinese actually launched this final attack uh, in the, only the very last days of the, of the Korean War. 
I mean, looking at the uh, the armistice agreement that uh, it had already been agreed to on the 19th of July. So, uh, why why was there another week of fighting uh, when it was the it was the 27th of July that it had been agreed on? And then why did the Chinese then launch uh, a division-sized attack to try and capture the hook, which was a significant uh, and strategic uh, outpost on the uh, uh, in front of the engine? Uh, only 40 kilometres north of Seoul. So looking at uh, what some of the reasons why and I mean, not having access to Chinese records made their motives quite difficult. But looking at uh, United States Marine uh, Corps records over at Quantico uh, and in the NARA archives in Washington, it re I really gained, gained a sense of the fact that they, they realised that this was a, a huge attack. They had very limited bridging behind them with a flooded Indian River. And it was almost a last ditch battle that the uh, the Marines and the Australians were fighting in these last few days of the of the Korean War, uh, and Brigadier Wilton overseeing this battle must have known that uh, it was a pretty fraught thing. That if the Chinese had broken through, there would have been at least a a four kilometre withdrawal uh, back behind the engine, giving up some uh, serious uh, strategic high ground as well. So it's a it's a, a very important battle to, to try and understand. And I hope uh, in writing my chapter and uh, doing. Uh, paying homage to Wilton's leadership and also the men of 2RAR and also the Marines of the 1st Division. Uh, I hope I've uh, given uh, some honour to those men and, and the, the, what they endured over those three days of the last days of the war to actually maintain the, uh, the United Nations front line. Good, so, thank you, Michael. I, I wish there was something especially poignant about the people who fight and die in the last hours or moments of a war. There's a, three very sad graves of Montbraha in France of Australian soldiers unknown and they all died on the 5th of October 1980 and you think what what terrible bad luck to be the last involved in a major war. Now it's our great pleasure and honour to hear from, as I said, our official historian of the Korean War, Bob O'Neill. Well Joan and team, thank you very much for the invitation to be here tonight. It's great to be uh, with such uh, a knowledgeable group of people who've worked hard over many years and produced some notable works. While David was talking <coughs> about John Wilson, I was thinking about this book, uh, which I've co-edited, which came out a few weeks ago. And <coughs> the second chapter of the book is by David and looks at, at why Wilson chose Book Tui as the place for the deployment of 1ATF. And of course, the answer is partly uh, in the battlefields uh, in 1953 in Korea. Wilton was horrified by the casualty levels that some American commanders were uh, willing to endure. And therefore he wanted us, when we we're in, in Vietnam, to have a safe line of evacuation uh, if the war should go, go severely wrong. Uh, so. Good to see you aboard, uh, David. Um, the Korean War to me has two memorable passages, uh, particularly one uh, is the Peach Rankin Report. Without the Peach Rankin Report, there might have been no Korean War. Uh, very few people understand its significance. Syngman Rhee was not an ideal ally and for several months, uh, this part of a year, he'd been making very belligerent speeches uh, about how they must go to war uh, and, and knock the communists out of, out of North Korea. And a lot of people were inclined to believe him, particularly uh, a lot of people in the United Nations. And so the United Nations Secretary General uh, put together a, a request amongst countries that were closely involved as we were then as members of the United Nations Council on, on Korea and we uh, agreed to send a team of military observers, just the two people and nobody else sent any military observers. But these guys were very clever, they did their work well in 14 days from the 23rd of May to the uh, no, sorry, I think from the 19th of May through to the 23rd of June, they patrolled up and down, they wrote their report at the end of their, their patrol. And, and the, the bottom line of the report was don't believe Kim, uh, Kim, uh, 
Sigmund Rhee, uh, he is bluffing. And uh, this report uh, got into the uh, entrees of the UN Commission on, on Korea uh, on the 24th of June 1950, the day before the North Koreans rolled over the demilitarized zone. The important thing in the report was that the South Koreans could not have initiated this war because they are just too much of a mess. And, and so using that, that report, the UN Security Council was able to take a decision to give combat support to the Republic of Korea and not just let the North Koreans run all over the top of them. Um, <clears throat> the Americans were helped in, in getting approval for, for their attack uh, or their, their support of, of South Korea by Stalin, uh, who at that stage was boycotting the Security Council. He wanted to show the United Nations up to be uh, a lot of hot air. And so uh, he had, had withdrawn his representatives and, and the result was there was no Russian to exercise a veto. And this was the, one of the great assets that the permanent powers on the Security Council had. He'd, he'd given it up. And so the Peter Rankin report comes in saying the South Koreans are innocent in this. And that gave the Americans and their friends just enough support. They got seven votes and seven were needed to get permission from the Security Council to send a force to South Korea. Well, let me move on to uh, an, another uh, vivid patch in, in my memory, and that was the role of Percy Spender, uh, our foreign minister, uh, who had been wanting for a long time to develop a closer defense relationship with the United States. He didn't know that he was necessarily going to get something like the ANSYS Alliance out of it. But, but he was a great tactician, but he had a big problem, and that was his boss, Bob Menzies, uh, who looked much more towards London than to Washington uh, for defense cooperation and, and assistance. And he and Menzies actually got into some pretty severe halts together while Menzies was crossing the Atlantic in the Queen Mary to, to pay a, a special visit uh, to the Truman administration. And Spender was able to do an end run on Menzies and get his offer to send the Australian army to Korea, which was something that Menzies really did not want to do. Anyway, uh, let, let me just wind up by saying this, the, the Korean War uh, is not only forgotten, neglected, it's, it's just unknown by a whole lot of people who would get a lot of fun out of doing more work on it. Thank you very much for inviting me today. We're frozen. You there, John? Do people hear me? John, John take it away, I think. Okay, well, look, um, uh, I'm mindful we're, we're, we're getting close to time. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Joan's uh, frozen in the background there. Obviously, the title of the book has really got to her. It's in from the cold, so cold, she's frozen out. <laughs> Pardon me. So hopefully we'll get Joan back in a moment. Um, but uh, I know, I think, Peter Edwards, are you, are you out there? Are you, would you like to say a couple of words? Peter's still there? Uh, he wasn't yeah, able there. to get back on. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, look, ladies and gentlemen, we're open to questions. Um, so if you'd like to um, write a comment in the chat box, um, and we can, uh, we can then go to you uh, from using your name as the point of reference um, to, uh, to raise a question, ask a question, uh, or raise a point of contention or discussion. Um, 
that obviously this book has got a lot of material and, and Bob has very rightly pointed out that it's a rich field. There's so much in there to get, get your teeth into. Um, and uh, the floor is open. So uh, very happy to take any questions that people might have. And uh, Tess, if you can help me out. I don't see any questions at this stage, um, but we, uh, we're very happy to entertain them or, or comments. Can you hear me or see me? Ah, uh, there you are, Peter. Yes, can't yeah. can hear you, but can't see. Ah, uh, well, um, I'm not sure if that makes a There's difference. Probably a little bit. Yeah, that, that, um, yeah. Um, right. If, uh, well, if you can hear me, anyway, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, there we go. We can see you too. Right. Uh, the 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 point I w uh, would like to make is that. Um, there's a legacy in terms of the Australia's uh, government's strategic approach, as well as the military, uh, about which um, <clears throat> David spoke so well. Uh, after, uh, for the 20 years after the Korean War, the Australian government, in considering military interventions, seemed to use the Korean War as a sort of a template, although it was a sort of, um, not exactly a scoreless draw, but it, it wasn't a, a great victory, as we all know, but it was a, uh, an, an armistice. Um, but from then on, the Australian government, when being asked to consider a military intervention, went through a sort of checklist uh, of criteria, which had been based on the Korean War involvement. Uh, they asked themselves, well, first of all, is it in Asia, East Asia to Australia's north? Um, how does it stand in the, uh, in the two great processes of the day, the Cold War and the decolonization of the uh, uh, European empires? Where does the US stand? Uh, and the, is the US going to provide military leadership as well as, and military strength as well as diplomatic support? Uh, where does the UK stand? Because we're much more comfortable fighting alongside the British, as, as David again mentioned, uh, and also being given opportunities for command, which we would never get fighting solely under American uh, leadership. Uh, are we involved in an international and preferably multiracial uh, coalition? So it doesn't just look as if uh, uh, four white nations, UK, US, Australia and New Zealand are trying to dictate the, what's happening in Asia. And do we have the sanction of an international organisation? Uh, and the, the Australian government went through that and tried to tick as many of those boxes as possible. And you can see them considering that whenever uh, uh, an inter intervention uh, was being considered. And as we know now, we did get involved in the emergency and Indonesian confrontation, uh, and eventually, of course, Vietnam. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to consider the, the lasting impact of the Korean involvement uh, at that strategic level uh, on the Australian government. So uh, my thanks, it was a great honor to be involved in that conference. I was delighted to uh, have a photo taken of uh, uh, the three surviving Australian military his, uh, official historians at that time, Bob O'Neill, David Horner and myself, and it's a great honour to be involved with you all tonight. Thanks very much, Peter. Good. That's wonderful. Thanks, Peter. Great to hear from you. Now, I assume I'm back on screen. Um, we have Thanks, three Peter. comments. First, firstly, one from Megan McRae, a historian of uh, the First World War, who says she unfortunately got to leave, but she's really looking forward to reading the book. I mind you, a new press, $60 or free. And uh, she's just finished marking exams at the Staff College that dealt with the Korean War and really looks forward to using the book there. So congratulations, she says, to the team. Uh, now let's have a look at the other questions. Perhaps um, the, the, the big question is, what if the two Koreas go to war again now? What would Australia do? That's from Amy. But this is this, uh, a shorter one that we might just get uh, dealt with I think relatively quickly, from WLM. Are the Korean War records available? Who'd like to answer that one? Bob? Sorry, I didn't hear the precise question. Are the Korean War records available? Uh, short answer is yes. 
but uh, it's it's a bit tricky because we we fought uh, the ground war as part of a, a British formation. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the the fullest army records are still in London. Whether they've all come to Canberra, you know, in the last twenty years since I finished uh, with my work, uh, I just don't know. But it's, it's something that ought to be taken up. John, could you add to that? Um, certainly, the the War Memorial is very well placed with a reasonable amount of records, but Michael is probably best placed to comment on that. We do hold the uh, the Commonwealth Division records for from the formation of the Commonwealth Division, but we also have the 27th Brigade records here as well, plus the battalions uh, and some of the, uh, a great number of the ship's records uh, as well. 77 Squadron's Korean War records I know are held by the National Archives here in Canberra and are digitised. And recently, the, with the COVID lockdown, the archives at Kew have actually offered their records to be opened for free and downloaded for free. So a great many uh, Korean War records are actually uh, digitised and available currently uh, through Kew uh, for free, which is a, a wonderful initiative on their behalf. Well, that's good news, Mike. Good. Mm. And again, a simple question before we get on to the future from Lee. How many Australians became prisoners of war in Korea? I think it was 29 or 30, was it not? 30. 30, yes. I thought there'd be an extra one found mm. uh, since uh, Bob wrote his Well, That section was written by, remind me, Bob, who wrote the section on POWs in your... Uh, Phil Greville. Yes, thank you. It's a very useful source. Mm. So to the big one, um, uh, how many Australians became prisoners... Oh, sorry, that's prisoners of war. Um, what would Australia do if, uh, if we face another war between the two Koreas. Um, John, do you want to start that one? But please, I think we could probably only afford two commentators on each question. So to the point, please, John. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Thank you, Joan, uh, because there is no set answer to that question uh, that, I am, that I believe there is. I, I, it really depends on the circumstances. Uh, and Australia, I imagine, would be very keen to minimise any footprint uh, in in a conflict, depending, of course, on the, how it unfolded as well as to what would be called on from Australia, mindful that the United States has a, an enormous footprint in the Republic of Korea, South Korea, uh, and much of the contingency planning that they undertake is premised on that work being done between the Republic of Korean forces and the US uh, Armed um, Forces Korea, US Forces Korea. So uh, it's it's conceivable we might get asked to, you know, if in, in extremists to help with Air Force, uh, perhaps Navy. Uh, uh, it's hard to imagine a scenario where we would be called for ground troops, but you know, nobody envisaged us going into East Timor in uh, November 1998. Nobody imagined we'd go to Korea uh, in, <laughs> in May 1950. Um, so never, uh, and, and I guess that's one of the things about Joint Operations Command, it is about contingency planning and about presenting options to government based on uh, a, a spectrum of possibilities from um, most likely to most dangerous and somewhere, sometimes a variety of scenarios in between. So uh, but to be fair, the, the government would, is always very careful about uh, any things about the future because you don't want to lock yourself into a commitment, very important for Australian diplomacy to have options and to not telegraph ahead uh, a signal that will actually lead us to be in a position that would probably be worse than had we not said we'd do something. So actually strategic ambiguity in a sense is really uh, a, a very sensible approach uh, while uh, background uh, planning and consideration of options is, is undertaken in secrecy. Thanks, John. Um, I'll ask others to comment on that question in a moment. But first, we've got another question, which I think relates to this issue of whether Australia would go into another Korean War. The question from Claire is, how was the war received at home? Were there protests like over Vietnam and Iraq or debates about conscription and national service, especially so soon after the end of World War II? So this gets the whole question, of course, of public support for wars. Um, Dave, would you like to comment on that? 
You're on mute, David. Yes, yeah. I mentioned earlier that this was the first war uh, conducted by the Australian Regular Army, and that had an interesting effect back on the community because during the First and Second World Wars, we had uh, uh, a citizen army, great connection between the soldiers who were fighting and, and, and the people back at home. Whereas now we had, had regular soldiers, yes, there were some volunteers who, uh, who specifically uh, volunteered to serve in Korea, but we, we had a regular army who were in some ways dissociated from the rest of the community. And uh, once things got underway, uh, apart from a, a few headlines in the newspaper and every probably something on the newsreels, it tended to be uh, overlooked by a lot of people in the community. So uh, no, there were not demonstrations against uh, Australians serving in, in the Korean War. Uh, they tended to be overlooked. Mm. I think, I think uh, Bob might also have some comment on that. Well, there was a, a little bit uh, of protest around the, the fringes, but it, it wasn't directed at uh, people serving in, in the Korean War. Uh, it was more uh, the, the gatherings of, of militant trade unions, uh, pe people who were inclined to support China uh, in, in world politics uh, rather than automatically go uh, down the line with the United States. I can remember uh, letters painted on a, st a steel railway bridge that, that my tram into the city used to, used to go under uh, in 1951-52 uh, and it had don't be yanked into Korea. <laughs> so you know there, there was some act activism but it was not great. Yes, I think in terms of responses today, were we to be, um, I suppose, invited or whatever to participate would be very much contingent on how um, politics in the United States evolve and how the US reputation um, survives, if it has to, another um, presidency of, of Donald Trump. Uh, I'm, we'll come back to the question of the future in a moment, but Julie was in first with a question, which is very different. She said collaboration must have been tricky. How was this managed to ensure the book has consistency and flow? Liam, are you still there? Would you like to comment on that? Oh, thanks, Joan. Um, it, um, as, as, um, as our audience may or might not know, um, the book um, was very much a, um, a continuity was um, often um, a bit of an issue because it, it the conference was originally in 2011 um, and then John and myself um, came on board in 2017-2018. Um, so what our main aim was to maintain the integrity of the papers of the conference in 2011 but also um, add some additional um, reflections on what it means for Australia today, what it means for the Korean Peninsula as well today um, and, and some broader reflections around the ongoing relevance of the Korean War um, more generally. But I think um, John might have some more comments to make on that perhaps. Oh, thanks Liam. Yes, um, Peter Pedersen did a good job in pulling the conference together in the first place and so there was an excellent array of speakers and you know several of them are in the room, the virtual room we're in right now. Um, so uh it was relatively straightforward to build on an excellent repertoire uh of of scholarship that was uh, the material presented for us to consider turning into a book um and um michael's work was really helpful uh, bringing the war memorial uh as a team to play with the anu and we liam michael and i conferred uh, on a number of uh, junctures about how we'd go about it. Uh, uh, Rebecca's role, uh, the, 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 the way we'd engage with the, the original authors of the chapter of the papers and, um, and bring it up to date. Some of them were talking about things that had contemporary implications that needed to be updated. So we engaged directly with the authors and Liam and Michael did that as well. Um, 
but essentially there was a there was a there was a structure that we that was already there that we then enhanced if you like and brought up to date so uh, and of course when you think about the structure that was released it's pretty it's quite compelling you think about it politics by the means korean skies and korean waters from generals to lieutenants the war on the ground and legacy so i just want to make a point too we haven't talked much about the navy and, and the air force but they really did play a quite a significant yes. and consequential role and and uh, you know it's, there is a, a natural inclination when when, when you've got a, a, a land focused historian such as myself uh, in, involved in a project like this to gravitate towards the maps and the pictures with uh, which are easy but the book has uh, and uh, and I, I might just if I may uh, if you'll indulge no, me no, for a no, second, no, John, no, no. <laughs> uh, the maps, the pickies. I just wanted to share some pickies from I well, just wanted we, to share some pickies we are 6 30 and we have another question to come john your bandwidth's very low i'm not sure if it's going to work yeah okay all right but just my point is that uh the air force and the navy made a very significant contribution this wasn't just about land forces um and it was uh you know we tend to disassociate them but it was all three services very active uh indarguably the, the air force up front played the most significant first role because it was able to work with the Americans in blunting the North Korean offensive. And that was very yeah. important. Yes, and I think that's a very important point that we tend often in Australian military history to overlook or push to the margins, the Navy and the Air Force, but air power was incredibly important as was sea power in this conflict. And I might remind you that the Russians, MiG-15 was, was happily flying the skies against us. Uh, powered by a jet engine that the British had put on the open commercial market in 1945, <laughs> which, the, which the Russians had modified. Well, a, a classic case, dare I say, of strategic and commercial policy not being well aligned in the case of the British government. Um, let's take this last question. Um, could there have been a permanent diplomatic solution? Could this have been forced on uh, the participants so to avoid the ceasefire difficulties that pertain today that's from Don question is could could somehow the heads have been knocked together in 1953-54 so that we don't live with this unresolved conflict well the problem was the heads had been knocking each other for two years uh, with the armistice talks <clears throat> and that they'd nearly fallen apart a number of times. They were fed up with it and they just wanted to, to get rid of it. It's very interesting that the uh, Joint Policy Declaration was signed the day after the, the armistice, and that's the Joint Policy Declaration that continues our status as co-belligerents um, in, in the Korean issue. Mm. There's another question that's just come in, which is related to that. To what extent did the death of Stalin contribute to the stalemate being brought to an end? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, I can't answer it uh, with ab absolute certainty because there were a, a, a number of other issues at, at play there, particularly in Beijing. But uh, the fact that Stalin's uh, dead hand was was taken off the, the levers in, in Moscow, made it a bit easier for those who, who wanted to, to be more flexible mm. about the ending of the war. Good. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Is there any final comment any of the presenters would like to make, particularly about the relevance of the book to today's strategic situation? Oh, yes, John. No, no, I might, if I may. Um, it's when you think about parallels for today, one of the most striking ones in my mind is the, the point that Dean Acheson made in early 1950 about Taiwan and Korea being cut off and irrelevant. There is, of course, considerable talk now about China's intentions to incorporate Taiwan back into. Uh, the People's Republic of China, and um, considerable conjecture about whether were that to happen by force, whether the United States would eventually 
give up and just put its tail between its knees and walk away and let the let China take Taiwan. Um, I, I suspect that um, phenomenon similar to what happened with the Pusan perimeter might actually uh, arouse uh, a democracy like the United States and perhaps others, perhaps like Australia, to rally in defence of Taiwan. And uh, I suspect a China in mind and in so doing is eager to huff and puff and avoid actually going there knowing that an aroused America and its allies can be a formidable foe. Um, and I, I'm, I remain firmly convinced that the Chinese uh, very much adhere to the dictum of Sun Tzu, which is to the acme of skill is to defeat your adversary without fighting. I, I really think that that's something that they hold very dear. Um, but you know, I may be wrong, uh, but uh, my sense is that they will do everything they can to intimidate and over time coerce the United States into believing that they can't win and that Taiwan can't hold back. But it does raise some very interesting questions about what happens when democracies in the sight of uh, you know, atrocity and, and something that we, we consider abhorrent, how they are aroused and how democracies respond to such challenges. We don't know the answer, uh, but it, it does raise very interesting questions. Thank you, Joan. Good, thank you. Yes, well, I was going to ask, you know, what are the prospects of, of a f another flaring up into, into full-scale violence, the situation in Korea. But I think I've decided after COVID-19 that any predictions about the future are totally flaw, flawed <laughs> and, uh, and unwarranted. As everyone says, we live in difficult and, and confusing times. But um, one, we've got a final message to say congratulations to everyone on a very successful launch and a very necessary book at this time. So perhaps on that last message, we'll call this... Uh, uh, launch to an end. I don't know if I meant to officially launch the book, but I am <laughs> launching the book, encouraging you to, to read it and to either in full or in hard copy or um, download it as this uh, great facility in today's environment. Um, though I am conscious of some, some of you live in, in a slightly less um, hot spot than, uh, than I am surviving at the moment. The ACT looks positively calm and, <laughs> and placid, as it always does indeed, could I say. So thank you to everyone that's been involved. Particularly, I'd like to thank um, Bob O'Neill for joining us, for the authors uh, who have contributed to the book and have been um, on um, our webinar tonight. So thank you so much and, and uh, hope our participants have enjoyed this um, in this rather Zoom-like environment. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Joan. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night.